how do you change your actual platform to see that. In your build settings inside of Unity, Control Shift B or File Build Settings, when we come in and we change them, right now we're uh, defaulted to Windows Store. If I want to go to a standalone build, I would switch a platform there or down here to Windows Phone Switch Platform. Let me actually go back and switch Windows Store since I'm on Windows Store here and change that down. There we go, because that's my default platform we're building for. Now we see the effect. That went from near three megs down to 15K, and we can see the size and quality has been reduced quite a bit. So I probably wouldn't use it on anything with a big screen. This is probably a good setting for phone. The idea is on these settings per platform, whatever platform you're exporting to that Unity supports, you can override that per platform and change those settings up a bit. So it's kind of a little bit of experimentation. Um, Alchemy Labs has a, a really cool product called the Multi-Platform Toolkit. And that kind of gives you an easier way to support compression inside of a platform. So for example, a universal app in Windows where you can uh, have one build that's going to target uh, inside of Unity, you're going to export universal apps for Windows Phone and for Windows 8.1. What you can do is separate them out inside of it. You can say, oh, we're going to Windows Phone 8.1. I want maybe this texture. And if we're going to be going to Windows Store uh, on Windows 8 style, maybe bigger devices than a, than a phone screen, I want to target this size texture. So you can definitely mix that up quite a bit on there. Um, just to show you really quickly, if you want to cut back to my screen, what we were talking about earlier with the light probes, um, this is the effect you'll get. So when you look at your character on the screen, as he runs around, you can see there's kind of that general ambience out here, but as he gets closer here, he starts to light up. So you'll kind of get those vertex shading on your character where it lights up and kind of just gives you a little more of that ambience as he runs around. I see, I see. So he's kind of general ambience and he goes here and he starts to light up and you can see those colors kind of hitting him. So just, you know, light probes are really, really good to give you that added kind of dimension to your characters and a little bit of shadow and feel to them. So just to, just to show some you. Some added info, very cool. Just some added info to kind very of give cool. you an idea of what that looks like. Awesome. So, so back to uh, compressing textures, we can change it real easy inside of Unity. Just check those off and change them per platform. Audio is easy as well. Uh, Unity supports a bunch of different audio types, Wave, MP3, uh, AUG, or OGG. Uh, so the idea is that if you have long bits of audio, uh, you kind of want to rethink that strategy. But either you have to highly compress, and I know you came across this when you were playing kind of full songs on yeah. long audio tracks. You found out that you had to really... Yeah, you want to keep your audio tracks down to basically loopable, maybe 30-second tops tracks, because when you have these very, very long songs that play, it's a major memory hog, especially for mobile devices. You're going to get major, major memory loss that you could potentially use for other things like graphics and everything else when you have all that memory being filled up by this audio. And it also reduces the loading time a lot on your game. So so when you have these huge songs, right, that are in your level that you have to load and you want to reduce that, just put it in a loopable track, makes it a lot easier. The, the lo levels will load up a lot quicker because it doesn't have to load in all that audio at once. Some folks might notice that on the, uh, the settings for audio in Unity, there's a, if we switch back to the slides here, this guy right here, stream from disk, that sounds like, well, hey, I don't have to load it all in the memory. The purpose of this is to uh, increase, to, to make your game load faster as opposed to have to wait for that audio. It plays faster. The downside is there's a lot of hits to storage, and that is also a drain on your game. So there's kind of trade-offs as a best overall strategy. Like Matt said, you want to keep these clips to lower length, loop them, and then switch in and out other clips to kind of uh, mix it up a little bit, right? Absolutely, absolutely. All right, let's talk about coding techniques next. So in Unity, you can do all sorts of coding optimizations. As a general rule, uh, some folks might say don't premature optimize. Uh, so there's all sorts of different tips and tricks and different times you may or may not want to use these. So I'll just talk about some of the basic ones here and kind of when you might want to use them. Remember that inside of Unity as it stands today, you're going in your code from this kind of managed code over to native code back again. So if you say to Unity, hey, I want to do something in code with this game object's transform. It's going to the native engine, getting an object and sending it back to you. And anytime you cross those boundaries, you hurt performance. Uh, so we're going to show a way that we can cache those up front. When you use techniques like gameobject.find, they scan every object in your game to try to find an object. They're very slow as well. Component references. Uh, we looked in a demo of getting a reference to an animator component. In those, if we're constantly saying, hey, get me my animator component and do this with it. Give me my animator component and do this with it. Over and over and over again, maybe multiple times a frame, that's going to really kind of hurt performance. So you can cache these references up front. We'll get some code uh, ways of doing that. In the editor inside of Unity, we can cache out a reference to there. We did that yesterday in the 3D game. We basically drag and dropped uh, our little text box into the Unity editor, and I'll show you a code example of that. And ideally, you want to avoid lookups and loops. Not trying to go back to Unity and asking for data 
in a loop, maybe inside of your update frame. Since it gets called so many times a second, you don't want a loop inside of your update calling out as well. And also object pooling, huge. If there's one thing to take away from today, object pooling. Pull your objects, pull your objects, pull your objects. And you say, Adam, what is object pooling? Well, I'll show you that in code. <laughs> Let's hop over to a code demo here. Yesterday in ZPS, we were doing things like spawning out all of these zombies one by uh, pumpkins. the pumpkins, <laughs> one by one by one. These guys all start coming around at me. Zombie uh, pumpkins? Zombie pumpkins. <laughs> <laughs> Clear this guy. So all these all these pumpkins that were coming out, they were all being spawned at several times. I would destroy one, it would go away, it would get destroyed, new ones would spawn. That's very, very, very expensive per, for performance. Because um, you have to spin up new objects every time. In addition, you have to, um, the runtime will do garbage collections every now and then. And yeah. when it does garbage collection, in your game pauses. So you want to allocate as few objects as possible. The idea think, is you I want think to use when we were when we were initially testing this, we had the pumpkins just kept coming. There was hundreds, oh, and my hundreds system maybe 200, crawled. 300 pumpkins because it just kept, kept spitting going, them out. And, uh, so it started great. The game would start <laughs> great. It would run like super, super smoothly. But crashing. then as those pumpkins started coming out and they started yep. filling up the screen, you saw this major performance hit. And then it was like running like a dog. It was just running so, so slow. So you, I got yeah, down you, to like four frames a second here. Exactly. So this is what object pooling is all about. You kind of want to limit the amount of objects that are on the screen at once. It yeah. kind of counts up that and basically this is what you're doing. Yesterday, to your point, this is exactly what we were doing here. We are basically coming in here and just constantly instantiating over and over and over again in a loop. Create, our create the number of zombies for us per wave, then we waited a little bit, created another, another wave, I'm sorry, pumpkins. <laughs> I'm Zombie zombies on the brain. Zombie pumpkins. <laughs> So this is uh, in the code that you're going to be able to download. I have spawn without pooling. That's what I was doing yesterday. Today, I'll show you my spawn with pooling. And I'm using one here called Trashman, which, just to show you the URL here, was also by the fellow from Prime31. There's a, you can write your own object pooler. You can download a bunch from the net. There's tons of them out here. This is just one I kind of I like how it works. It's pretty easy to use. All you're doing here, rather than getting a brand new object, what you're doing is you're downloading the trash man uh, component. You're adding a game object to your scene. I called mine trash man. And you have this trash man script over here. Great name. <laughs> it uses, it's got a, it's a recycle bin and a trash man. You drag your prefab on here. So I took the pumpkin, dragged it on here, and it created a recycle bin for a pumpkin. I said, all right, how many do you want to pre-allocate? Well, I'm matching this to my wave size. I want 12 pumpkins to come on my screen at once. And here I'm saying, you know what? I don't ever want to go above 12 pumpkins. I'm going to wait until that player has to destroy them. Even if it's time for the second wave, what this does is when you ask the pool for another pumpkin, if there's already 12 out, it's just going to return null. There's not one available. So without having that checked, it'll do 12 at a time, essentially. And then that could add up and be even higher than 12. But if that's checked, it'll only make sure that there's only 12 at once. Yep, it can go higher. Uh, in, in that case, it'll, then it has to allocate more. What I've done in this case is I've said, I've got a hard limit of 12. Do not give me any more than 12. Now, this number doesn't have to match the above. I could say, start out with 12. I could make this 20, and then it's going to cut off at 20. So kind of fool around with that. I'm going to make this match my wave size just for, uh, I think, for performance. It makes sense to me that way. In the code, it's really easy. We say, trash man, give me a pumpkin. That's all we do. And then, let me search here, and I will show you the where we despawn. Once we kill a pumpkin, we call its die method, and all I do here is I despawn that. Now, I am kind of, uh, I could respawn my particle systems here. This is kind of a no-no, I would say. I should, I should actually recycle my particle effects here. So right now, trash man despawn my game object. Now, whenever I want to create a new one again, I spawn it, and then I just happen to reset the values on there. And if I look at my pumpkin here, I just have a little reset value that comes in here, uh, sets its health back to its initial health, stops any running coroutines, just to start those values out again. You always want to make sure you reset your, play, your, your object's health or whatever values you need to reset in there before going again. Now, let's run over to Visual Studio here again. Stay in Visual Studio, I should say. And I just want to show you a code optimization script. Just a couple techniques in here. So one. Up front, we did this yesterday. As soon as my object, before its first frame is ever even rendered, when this object first starts up, there's one called before start, called awake. We can use void start. This happens right before the first frame. 
Other objects are generally initialized by this stage. As of now, with the awake method, I only know that my object is awake. I have no idea if there's any other objects instantiated or not. In this case, it's early on in the process. I know I can get a reference to my own animator component. I'm going to use this all over. So I want to get that early, cache it up front so I don't have to uh, go back and forth asking Unity for it. Now this here, another one. When my game starts up, I'm doing this in start because now I know other objects likely exist at this point in time. In other words, I know my player is going to exist by the time my start method is called. Start is right before the first frame for this pumpkin is rendered. Oh. I know that my main player at this point in time is already awake. It might not be rendered yet, but I, it's safe to call it here. I'm saying finding my player, I'm caching that reference. Now anywhere in my game, in this, uh, in this code, I can use player without having to search for it all the time. You'll find that some folks will do things in their update method like that. Every frame they're searching for it. Very, very, very bad for performance. Do this up front, cache those references, use them later. Again, caching reference here. I'm calling transform.position every time. The ideal way, and this is being called an update, it's happening every frame. The ideal way here is to go up top of my code and do something like this. Cache to reference that transform, and I can use that later on without having to go back and forth between my, uh, my code and Unity's native code. Saves on performance there. So all these places here, rather than using transform, I would be using my cache transform like that. So that's one way to save on those calls. It's a good tip. Now, finds. Just like we found our player in the beginning. So let me scroll up here. On start, I cached a reference to my player. I'm doing the exact same thing here. Gameobject.find zombie kid. You don't want to do this every update. Gameobject.find searches through every object until it finds one. Now this one here is a little bit more performant. This only searches objects that have a tag set on them. Find game object with tag, I'm looking for my player. Again, I don't want to do this in update, I only want to do this up front. And as I showed you in the beginning here, my animator component, so if I right click and I go to definition, I'm just creating a private variable here called animator, and when I wake up, I'm getting a reference. I'm calling get component, so it's a little bit slower. It's got to search that object for that component. I don't want to do that every frame. Cache it up front, and then wherever you use it in your code, you can just use that private variable and reference it. A couple little tips that go a really, really long way. Object pooling, let's go back to that slide here. Object pooling and not searching for objects in update, cache those references can really, really help for performance. Great. All right, let's move on to almost to the last subject, terrain and skyboxes. We'll just talk about real fast here. Mm -hmm. Unity terrain, it's got a really cool terrain system in there. When we get to the demo uh, for the next section, reducing geometry, you'll show a quick demo on there. Absolutely. Um, it's a cool system, but it generates many draw calls. So you can experiment with some of the built-in settings in Unity. Uh, they have some of these settings we can see on the slide here. Reducing pixel error can actually reduce the number of draw calls for terrain. Terrain is really hefty. You can drop a terrain in your scene, next thing you know you have 300 draw calls. Really draw call heavy. There are some really cool third-party tools, T4M, Terrain for Mobile, to help optimize your terrains. You're gonna do a demo with Topo Gun. Yep. Skyboxes, yesterday we looked at creating a sky in our world. Skybox has six images that get tiled around your world to make it look like you have a sky. That's six draw calls. Uh, KGFS Skybox has a kind of a cool little plugin that you can use, get from the asset store, that will reduce it down to one draw call. Uh, there's probably some manual methods you could do as well. For me, I love using the asset store. If I find a cool package on there, I download it and I use it quite repeatedly. In fact, every virtually any studio, any developer I've ever talked to who's made professional games, they've got several assets they love from the asset store. Great. Lastly, reducing geometry. Some might say one of the most important subjects, this and reducing draw <laughs> calls, right? Yep. Well, geometry, polygons and triangles in your game. It's important to know that polygons in your game are drawn using triangles. So when you model your character, you have what people refer to as polys in there. Those are actually drawn using triangles. Unity uses triangles. Your graphics card actually draws triangles. If we look at this cube on the right hand side here, we can see this cube surface is actually two triangles. Quad is two triangles. Quad is two triangles, what a coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> so even 2D images use triangles. And this is where that term tries, when you hear people tries. go, how many tries are in your, you know, level? Yeah. What, what's the tri count? That's triangles. That's triangles. Just a, it's just a nickname for triangles. On the right hand side here, for uh, the cool logo Matt created, zombie, pumpkin slayer, 
Guys, I didn't hear you. There we go. Woo! <laughs> uh, look at all of these triangles that make this up. Even a 2D image uses triangles behind the scene, how uh, Unity determines how to display 